What's up guys, this is Chris here, and today we're gonna to be talking about something pretty important. We're gonna be going over a few concealed carry tips that just might save your life. Now, I've done a couple of these lists in the past, however, they're pretty old, so I decided to do a larger, more all-encompassing video where I talk about a lot of tips that I think will probably help people out. A more condensed version so you can just watch this video and you can have kind of a better concept of what you might wanna do, what you might wanna train, and things you might wanna watch out for in the concealed carry realm. Now, we're talking about pretty much exclusively civilians here. We're talking about people who carry concealed and we're talking about the situations that you might run into not necessarily law enforcement or military trust me they have their own training anyway they don't need me some of these might seem like they're regurgitated but a lot of them are new and some of these might seem obvious to some of you but not others before we get into the video I do want to mention my page supporters we try to give you guys the most honest gun content possible if you want to support the channel I'd really appreciate it if you go down to the link in the description and sign up for patron the industry doesn't always love us so we really appreciate your support. I also want to mention a local shelter in Ames, Iowa. It's the YSS. They could really use your help. I also leave the donate link in the description of this video. So if you guys want to go down to that description and click that donate page and give a few bucks to those kids, I'd really appreciate that. With that being said, let's just jump right into the list because there's a couple of them here and we're going to go over the first one, learn to draw with one hand. Now I know that seems kind of obvious, but if you've never actually practiced it, it can be a little bit tricky, especially considering you might be in different positions when you have to do so. Why would you want to be able to draw with one hand? Well, there's actually a lot of reasons. First thing, you could be carrying a child that you obviously don't want to drop. The second thing is you could be escorting somebody. You could be carrying somebody on your shoulder that was already injured. You could have an injured arm, and you could also be an entanglement of some type. I know a lot of people in the last video I mentioned said that there's a difference between fights and gunfights, and to me, there's not. Usually a gunfight is an escalation of a fight that has already taken place, and that's just a reality. It goes from a standard, you know, knuckle up kind of thing, or maybe a robbery, straight into a life or death situation, and you guys need to know when that level gets higher, and once it does, if you need to draw your gun, for example, like maybe he gets a hold of your arm and starts stabbing you with a knife, maybe you need to defend the knife first, and then you need to go to your gun, but he still has your wrist. There's a lot of situations you might want that for, especially if you do combatives and like jujitsu with weapons and stuff like that, you'll find there's a lot of weird positions where you might only be able to get your gun with one hand you might only be able to grab it upside down with your left hand and you're still gonna need to work that gun with your pinky and I just think that's something that could easily be practiced at home with dry fire with no rounds in the gun whatsoever you just make sure the guns clear and you go to a safe place and you learn to draw your gun a couple of different ways with a couple of different grips and things like that that way you're at least confident that you've done it before the other thing that I would work on is make sure clearing the garment and grabbing the gun at the same time with one hand can be relatively difficult. Sometimes you get entangled in yourself while doing that, so it's good to have some practice. Number two, kind of an extension of the first one, but learn to fight in general. I know that sounds kind of stupid, but it's a fact. You want to have some break contact moves like a jab or maybe a front kick. You want to be able to use a collar tie. You want to be able to push somebody off balance in case they're trying to get a hold of your gun. You want to have some grappling techniques, two-on-one control, stuff like that. You want to be able to just grapple a little bit and strike a little bit because life is messy, fights are messy, robberies are messy. Anything you might need a firearm for is gonna be crazy, chaotic, dangerous, and all around just fucked up. So you're gonna be able to be better served by having a general knowledge of fighting. And general knowledge of fighting, whether you take boxing or kickboxing or Muay Thai, it'll give you a, a general idea of distance. How quickly people can close distance, what they can do at certain distances, whether he can kick you in the face or not while you're trying to draw your gun. And it just gives you an overall knowledge and experience in an aggressive situation that you can't get otherwise. Going to jiu-jitsu practice or wrestling practice is a good way to go full bore, full contact, learn how that feels, and then you can apply your firearms skills and techniques to that. And you have like a better mindset. 
And if you're a high risk person, for example, like a smaller statured, beautiful woman living in a bad neighborhood, you might want to know some jujitsu in case some guy decides to throw you on the ground and get on top of you. You might want to be able to make him pay for that with a Kimura or a triangle choke. You put him in a triangle choke, draw your gun, there's a lot of ways that you can do things and you may not be able to overpower your opponent, but you can outsmart him with different techniques and different tactics. You run into a striker, you better know a little grappling. You run into a grappler, you better know how to stay on your feet and strike a little bit. It's good to know a lot of things in a lot of areas and you can use whatever tool in the toolbox you need to use. Number three, carry on your body. If you can. Now I know there's some caveats to that. Maybe a fanny pack might work, but it is in fact strapped to your body. Uh, you might use a belly band, but again, on your body. And the reason for that is in case somebody gets a hold of you and throws you on the ground, you might not be able to get to your purse. Somebody might take your purse. Somebody might take your backpack. You might leave your backpack somewhere by accident and now your gun's gone. You gotta call the ATF. There's a shitload of reasons why you might want to have your gun on your person. The main reason is because if you're gonna use a gun, if you're gonna need a gun, the chances are it's gonna happen quickly. You're gonna need to get to it quickly. The other reason is in case you get it stolen, in case you leave it somewhere, those are all bad things. Things, and most guns used by criminals are guns that were once legal that were stolen by people who weren't paying attention. So if you want to arm the bad guys, that's a good way to do it. Number four, train with your concealed carry pistol, the ammo and the holster and the clothes that you normally wear. So you see a lot of guys on Instagram and they're shooting real fast and they're appendix carrying a Staccato XC. Do you think those people carry that gun in real life? Well, most of them don't because I meet some of those people. If you train all day with a Staccato XE and you carry a Sig P365, you might not be as prepared as you think you are. Also, if you train in a pancake style appendix holster and you're using that all the time because it draws really fast and then you decide to use your deep conceal uh, three o'clock holster or appendix holster, it's not gonna draw the same. You're not gonna be able to get the same grip. You're gonna have a smaller grip with a smaller handgun. You might end up finding out you're gonna get it caught on your, on your shirt. You might end up finding out that you can't can't get to your spare magazine, so that's not the way you want to carry it. There's a lot of things you can find out by training with the actual stuff that you use, and it doesn't look as cool, and it's not as fun, because it's not as much fun to shoot a P365 as it is a Staccato XC, but it is extremely useful, and if you needed to use that gun in a time of need, the more time you have on that gun with that system, that holster, and those clothes, the more confident you're going to be, and the less you're going to need to think about that, and the more you can think about the situational awareness that everybody talks about. When you can do things a thousand repetitions, you don't have to cognitively think about that anymore. You can do all the stuff you need to do and then problem solve with your frontal lobe. I would also really work on malfunctions clearing. That's a very common thing that happens in situations in real life simply because for one reason or another, the slide gets impeded or the action of the gun gets impeded in some way. And most people never even practice uh, malfunction clearing. Either buy some shitty ammo, you know, buy something that says Remington on it, or buy <laughs> or get some dummy rounds and put a dummy round like one every six or seven rounds in your mag magazine and you'll be able to practice some of those malfunction clearing drills where they become second nature as well. In case you get it entangled in a shirt or in, for whatever reason your gun stops working, you can get it working again. Another one, have your concealed carry system be as comfortable as possible. Now, a lot of people say comfortability is second, and I agree, I agree with those people. Functionality should be first, but the reality is if it's uncomfortable, most people won't have it on them. That's just the way it is. If you carry a Staccato P or if you carry a Glock 34, there's a strong chance that that gun's gonna be in the truck half the time. Whereas opposed to you carry a Sig P365 or maybe a Shield Plus, at least the fucking thing's gonna be on you. And in which case it's actually useful. It's not really, opportune to have to run out to your truck and come back when somebody's shooting at you. <laughs> so it's better to have the gun on you than the awesome gun that you don't have. And the more comfortable the gun is, the more likely you are to carry it. And then someday when you get comfortable and trust carrying a small gun, hell, it might be a little easier to carry a big gun since you're more experienced. Six, choose the carry position and type of holster that best fits you. This is another thing I see on Instagram a lot. Everybody goes to appendix because that's the cool thing to do. Everybody goes to three o'clock because that's the cool thing to do. Six o'clock, however you want to carry. Don't carry six o'clock, I shouldn't have said that. But <laughs> there's a lot of different ways to carry a gun. You can pocket carry, you can carry in a fanny pack, you can carry in a shoulder holster if you need to. But the reality is as long as it's comfortable enough for you to carry all day, it's concealable enough to where you're not worried about like bending over at Menards or anything like that. And if it's comfortable, if it's concealable and you're confident with the gun, then just stick with it. Cause it's better to have the thing that you're comfortable with that works well for you and your body type than it is to find out that maybe this super fast way that you conceal carry just isn't comfortable enough for you in the car or whatever it may be. 
Number seven, if you can, be able to run. And that's just a thing that people get pissed about. When you say that, they're like, well, you know, you shouldn't have to run, you should be able to stand your ground, and you should. Every state should have stand your ground. You shouldn't have to be legally obligated to run, but you should be able to run if you are physically able. If you are not disabled, if you are not elderly, you should be able to run. There are situations that you cannot handle, and there are situations that you shouldn't handle. There are situations you should just leave from, and it's not worth it. There are situations that you can't handle, and you need to run. And in which cases, not only should you be able to run but you should know how to break contact from a fight from a grappling experience you should be able to put somebody on their ass if you have to you should be able to jab somebody or front kick somebody off you enough to create space to either get your gun or shoot if you have to and as soon as they break contact with you run that's just a reality that doesn't get taught a lot but there's a lot of situations where it's better just not to be there like a girl being attacked by a guy that's 300 pounds and looks like Brock Lesnar for example maybe not a good idea to try an arm bar looks cool but the reality is is that it's a low percentage percentage thing and if it's super low percentage and you have nothing to gain and everything to lose just boot scoot and boogie on out of there number eight know the distances you can shoot and hit on a fist size target every time so if you're looking at the human beings vitals if you're looking at the head if you're looking at basically you're looking at a line of defeat you, you want to hit this spot here, you want to hit this spot here, or you want to hit this spot here. And in which case, a fist size group is usually good enough. And as long as you can put a couple rounds into a fist size group at known distances, then you know how far you can or can't engage somebody successfully. If you're just winging rounds through Walmart at some guy, you're more likely to hit somebody and hurt them than you are help somebody out. So you're gonna wanna know the distances you can engage, what your gun and what you are capable of as a unit. Number nine, avoid putting aftermarket parts on your firearm that will change reliability. Now, some aftermarket parts won't and some will, and I'll give you some examples. You can put any type of sights you want on your handgun, and most likely it's not gonna change anything. However, if you change the weight of the recoil spring, there's a pretty good shot you just fucked yourself. Things that can make your gun faster often have a tendency to make your gun less reliable. So even putting an optic on certain guns or putting a light on certain guns can change the reciprocating mass and it can change the way that the gun and the harmonics and everything work. And sometimes just putting a weapon light on a gun can cause malfunctions with certain ammo types. So if you are gonna change anything, I always say vet that with at least 500 or 1,000 rounds, especially if it's something like a ported barrel, especially if it's something like a recoil spring or upper parts or trigger springs or anything like that. If you change the trigger, if you change anything in the upper, and if you change the recoil spring or magazine springs or adding magazine base plates, all can cause failures. If you change something on the gun that it comes out of the factory, make sure to vet it. Number 10, if it's possible, practice in some awkward positions. You don't know where you're gonna be, what you're gonna be doing, or what the hell is gonna be going on when this moment of need may arise. And it may never arise, and hopefully it doesn't, because that's what we're counting on, right? But if it does, we wanna be prepared kind of like modern day Boy Scouts. And in situations like that, you're not gonna want to have shot the first time from rollover prone. You're not gonna want to have shot the first time through a little keyhole or whatever you need to do. And if you can, and if it's applicable to you, maybe get a VTAC barricade, maybe shoot from kneeling once in a while if you can, maybe shoot from prone once in a while. Most people don't shoot handguns from prone, but if somebody's shooting at you, I bet the first thing you do is hit the ground. Keep that in mind. Most people never shoot behind cover, but if you're being shot at, that's a pretty good place to be. So I would practice shooting around corners without over silhouetting yourself. I would practice shooting around corners kneeling and in prone. I would practice rollover prone. I would practice both knees, both hands, whatever you need to do. I even shoot from the hip a lot, A, because it looks cool, and B, because you never know when somebody's hitting you with a baseball bat and you're gonna have to draw your gun and actually do something with it. Now. Something else that we don't talk about is car use. Have you ever had to draw your gun inside a car? Because that's a high percentage thing that you may have to do someday. So it might behoove you to practice in a chair if you can. Maybe just bring a folding chair out to the range someday, sit in a chair and draw a couple times and pop a couple rounds off and see how it feels. Number 11, try a competition any competition, doesn't really matter. As long as it has people there to make you nervous and a timer to make you extra nervous, that is a good thing. You wanna have people that bring up that level of pressure. Now it's never gonna be able to replicate something like a shooting or a combat scenario or even a bar fight, but it will give you a lot more stress than you're accustomed to. Especially maybe adding a little cardio and a little movement involved, which most competitions do. If you go to a, a local USPSA match, the sport that I generally shoot, you will experience 
experience stress, you will experience targets that are far away that are harder to shoot than you imagine, and you will have to do them all on the move while being timed, while competing against all the other people that are most likely better than you if this is the first time you're there. So you get to experience failure, which is awesome, because if you don't experience failure, you're never gonna get better, and you also get to experience pressure, which is very important, because if you stress inoculate to pressure, you can handle just about anything. Now, IDPA, three gun, anything that gets you up and moving and gets your heart rate moving is a good idea. Number 12, get out and have some fun. That is understated. We make all these serious like regulations and you have to keep a log book and you have to do all this stuff, but the reality is you can learn almost everything you need to know for self-defense just simply by having fun. Okay. So that's the whole point, like your hips are your power, right? And if I have your hips, I'm gonna hard to get. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Boxing sparring is a good time. Going to jujitsu is a good time. Shooting on the range is a good time. Just let go, flow, and let yourself have some fun. Plink around, get used to your gun. Try a few different guns because you never know if you're going to be shooting with your gun or somebody else's. On top of that, malfunction clearing drills happen just by the nature of buying cheap ammo. So go out there and buy some cheap ammo for target ammo and go out and plink around and have some fun. Hell, if you want to get serious about clearing malfunctions, just buy a Taurus. You can use that for your range gun. You'd be clearing malfunctions before you know it. Next thing you know, you'll be just tapping, racking your Glock, and you won't even care. That's the other thing about competition is it helps you fight through problems. You know, if you're on a stage in competition and you have a malfunction, well, you don't just stop there and say, oh, I guess I just quit. Nope, you gotta clear it as fast as you can and get rounds on target, and that's what you'd have to do in real life. Jesus fucking Christ. That was terrible. There's no quit in real life, and it's good to replicate that in your practice. Also, having fun eases things and it allows you to learn things through repetition that you can't learn any other way. There's no other way to get good at something. It's just the 10,000 hour thing is the 10,000 hour thing. The more you do a thing, the better it's gonna be. I hope you liked a couple of these tips. Obviously, that doesn't cover everything, but I think it helps cover a lot of things. Maybe some people don't talk about, some people do. We didn't get too much into the gear on this one, like belts and holsters and things like that. If you want me to be more specific about that, I can do a video on that as well. I do have several. I did bring my carry guns, well, the three common carry guns I carry lately. So I wanted to show a couple, well, the three small ones anyway. Actually, I have like 10 guns in my carry rotation, but I am a gun reviewer after all. You don't need 10 guns. Sig P365. In a phalanx holster this is a really good setup i know people ask me about that and then the other gun that i've been carrying the most lately is going to be the the uh, shield plus in the phalanx concealment holster as well phalanx doesn't pay me that doesn't they don't send me any free holsters or anything like that i buy these uh, just because i like them they fit me really well they fit the right ride on my belt so i can get my whole hand around the grip of the gun which i like a lot and it pins it against my belly so you don't see it very much so they're comfortable and they're useful i like both of these guns and they work for me but if they don't work for you, find something that does. Usually my holsters are color coded because I have a big tote full of holsters inside and I wanna know which gun goes to what. So I often use weird bright colors to kind of distinguish what holster it is. Now I know I could use a Sharpie and write on there, but it's just kind of an excuse to have a bunch of fun holsters. That being said, if you like this video, please like and subscribe. If you have tips, put them in the comment section below. There's a lot of smart people in my comment section at least. So by all means, if you have some smart tips, go down there and put them down there and we can all learn as a community. Please support your local homeless shelters and remember to recycle. I'll check you later. Right. Big man. Ow. Ow. <laughs> you know what I mean?